Assalamu alaikum. Uh, welcome to the last lecture of data mining this semester. Uh, so today we will wrap up our discussion on time series analysis, which we had started a couple of lectures ago. And this is, as I said, the last content for this course in this semester. So, <clears throat> so time series analysis is basically concerned with the analysis and mining of time series data, which is a particular type of contextual data where the contextual information is essentially the time and the behavioral attributes can, can be a scalar, can be a vector, or can be any other uh, data representation like a graph or a sequence or anything. But primarily we are focusing on scalars as well as uh, vectors, which basically translates to univariate and multivariate time series. So let's get started then. <clears throat> so uh, for time series, so we were discussing time series as a data type. And then we discuss all the various steps that can be done on them. We started with preprocessing, and the various steps that are involved in preprocessing were discussed. Uh, and most significantly, the issue of uh, interpolation, the issue of noise, the issue of, uh, for example, using the exponential smoothing for smoothing out noise in time series data. We also discuss uh, the use of uh, some signal processing techniques like DWT and DFT and DCT for compression, as well as for representation and reduction. And uh, we talked about normalization, which is actually quite similar to the normalization that is done for normal data sets. We also talked about similarity for time series data, and we introduced the idea of DTW, this dynamic time warping for determining the similarity between two time series. So after that, we talked about uh, um, basically forecasting. So forecasting is essentially done through uh, regression modeling and traditional regression modeling could be autoregressive. It could be autoregressive with moving average or autoregressive with integrated moving average or in other words, autoregressive differencing and moving average. Uh, so those are the common techniques uh, that are used for forecasting. But as I said last time as well, nowadays mostly we use neural networks or sequential models, sequential neural network models for forecasting. So things like recurrent neural networks or gated recurrent units or long short term memory models, as well as the transformer are now commonly used for forecasting. So then we talked about motifs. So motives essentially is a pattern that occurs frequently. And of course we are talking about patterns. So this pattern is in time series. So motives can be found in a single time series or they could be found across or in multiple time series. So uh, mostly we use a nested loop type of approach where you select a motive, which is a pattern within the time series. And then you try to match over the entire time series. So, and of course, in motive detection, we would like to find the top K motives in the data set, which is the top uh, K most frequently occurring patterns in the data set. As I said, there are two types. Of course, you can find patterns within one time series or across multiple time series. So across multiple time series, that would be similar to like sequential pattern mining. And it would become identical to sequential pattern mining if you convert the data to discrete values. And in general, if you convert your discrete values, you have a greater set of tools available for you for uh, motif as well as sequential pattern analysis. So then we talked about clustering. So clustering uh, and 
then later on we'll talk about outlier very briefly, detection, and then finally classification. So these three are essentially, if I start from here, and then we can complete this. So in, in all these three, clustering, outlier, and uh, classification, we typically distinguish between two main settings. One is point, point clustering or point outlier detection or point classification. And the other is shape, clustering, shape detection, outlier detection or shape classification. So what is the difference between the two? So when I talk about point, so I basically talk about a particular value at a particular timestamp. So in other words, we are thinking of the time series as a, uh, as a, as a you can say values over time. And we were looking at a particular value at a particular time. So you can look at that value and then based on those values, you can perform clustering, which we discussed last time, uh, which is online clustering. You can use online correlation clustering, or you can even use uh, a window and then apply a k-means type of approach on that. So that would be point approach. The other is shape. So basically uh, consider the entire time series over a over some time period. It's not a particular single value. Okay. So now if we talk about shape clustering, it's essentially, let's say if you have a time series over five days for temperatures and you have them multiple time series of temperatures and multiple locations at Lahore, you want to now cluster this. So this would be shape clustering. It's not about a particular point, it's about the entire sequence of points uh, over the time period. So in this case, you would again, you can use k-means if both values are of the same, you have the same number of values in all the time series, or you can use the DTW approach if there are different number of values, in which case you basically uh, align the two time series and then find the similarity between them. So dynamic time warping can be used there. So this is uh, this was uh, for clustering, but the same idea continues for outlier as well as classification. So, so let's just quickly discuss the I think we will be able to finish this in the next 10, 15 minutes because there's nothing really new there. Outlier. Uh, detection or anomaly detection. So outlier detection, when you consider point outlier detection, meaning that you are trying to determine whether a particular value or maximum maybe a couple of values deviate significantly from the rest of the observations. So when you talk about point outlier detection, uh, value, deviating deviates significantly from the preceding. Remember, this is a time series, so you only have the preceding values, okay? <clears throat> so in this case, mostly we use the regression type of approach. So remember, we use regression for forecasting where you predicted the next value, right? So the idea in outlier detection is you determine how different is the predicted value from the actual value. If that difference is more than some threshold, then you consider it to be an outlier. So this is a simple idea. And of course, as I said, regression modeling can be done through AR, ARMA, ARIMA, or even uh, a sequential neural network. So when, let's say, let's say we are talking about a particular timestamp, let's say, we are trying to predict the value for temperature, let's say at a time, let's say five, some index five. So, so you will have a predicted value five. So let's say the predicted value, which is given by the model that you have learned is let's say 30. And let's say at exact time five, you also observe the actual value. So let's say that is 35. 
So this difference, this difference, 35 minus 30, if this difference is greater than some threshold, then we can say x5 is an outlier. So this is the general idea. Okay. So time series point outlier detection uh, is works in this way. So of course you have other applications as well. So you can have applications in the industry as well, where you have sensors recording values and you want to determine whether, uh, so for example, there might be a malfunctioning sensor. So that malfunction might result in a different value from the previous values. So you can detect through it through uh, a regression model type of approach. So by the way, this approach is unsupervised. You do not need labels whether the next value is uh, an outlier or anomaly or not. So we only use a regression model, which is based on the values that you already see to predict the next value. And then we compare that next value with the actual value. And if that is, as I said, greater than a threshold, you can classify or label it as uh, an outlier. But this is an unsupervised approach. You can also use supervised, supervised uh, learning for this. So how so? Simply you will need, not need labels. So your data set would not be labeled. So for each x i, you also have the CI, okay? and if CI, let's say if it is just simple uh, binary classification, so you can say, so, uh, so you can say there are just two values here, so two labels here, so we have outlier, not outlier, okay? So now you will have data set like this, and then you train a classifier model, which takes as input some preceding values and you predict the next value. Actually, you can even use a, a neural network for this case, a sequential neural network like RNN or uh, uh, transformer for this prediction task. So this classification task. Of course, in this case, you do need some label data for each value you will have to have the label, which is either outlier or not an outlier. This problem is usually often unbalanced in practice. So why? Because in general, most of the values that you observe would be not an outlier or not an anomaly, only a few would be outliers. So oftentimes the percentage would be very skewed. So for example, 99% would be normal values and 1% would be uh, anomalous values or outlier values. So building a classifier for such unbalanced class distributions is often a challenge. So this is something that has to be addressed while learning a supervised model for uh, classification and for outlier detection. So for outlier detection, as I said, you can use an unsupervised approach, which is typically based on forecasting. And you can use a supervised approach, which can use any classifier, but for this, you do need some labeled data set. And of course, you will also have to be careful about the unbalanced uh, class distribution. Uh, actually, point outlier detection is also sometimes called event detection. So usually it might be an event of interest to, uh, to the data miner. And of course, depending on the data and the application that event may signify a different thing. So for example, an event could be a failure of a sensor. So failure of a sensor, for example. Okay, so event could be even if you consider uh, if you consider Twitter feeds, 
uh, as a time series, let's say you are recording the number of retweets at every hour, in every hour. So you can apply this to detect events as well. And events here could be uh, any catastrophic. So, quick event. So like, like a disaster or a major event like a sporting event or an earthquake and so on. So you can, there will be a sudden spike in uh, the observed number of retweets or tweets at a particular time. So oftentimes for point analysis and even for shape analysis and in general for time series, uh, we will need signal processing. I mentioned this before as well. Uh, so in this case, oftentimes DWT is considered a beneficial transformation, dyna uh, sorry, discrete wavelet transforms, because this is a transformation in both space and time. Uh, so it can detect local variations in frequencies uh, in the time series. So especially for outlier detection, DWT transformation is helpful because we only we are looking for local changes in behavior. So you have a trend that is coming and then suddenly the trend changes. So there's a local change. So you can compress or model the data D, to, to, using DWD, DWT, discrete wavelet transform quite well. And uh, so this uh, is, is, is quite common. Uh, actually, just a side note, I think this is something that I used way back 20, 25 years back in my PhD while I was analyzing traffic signals, I used DWT to compress and process the data. And there also we were doing anomaly detection. So what was the anomaly? So basically traffic, incidents. So you have a time series of observed traffic behavior. Uh, so for example, you are recording the number of cars that passed every five minutes. So, so you have a time series, number of cars. So you have a time series that is recorded every five minutes. And then if let's say if an accident occurs, obviously the number of cars uh, that are at a particular location will either increase depending on what you're measuring, they, that will increase significantly. Everything, everyone will stop back to back. So such detection can also be done. And, and by the way, that would be event detection. In this case, accident or incident detection. And it's basically a point outlier detection of a time series. So back then I also used discrete wavelet transform to process the time series. All right, so that was point uh, outlier detection. Similarly, you can have shape. So what is shape outlier detection? So let's say you have a whole complete time series over uh, a fixed time period. So now you want to determine which time series as a whole, not a point as a whole is different or anomalous. So let's say uh, you have recordings of sensors from 10 locations. So let's say you have some pressure, let's say pressure recordings from 10 locations, and you have recordings from, let's say the past, uh, let's say 24 hours. So you have, let's say 24 readings. So now you want to compare which sensor recording is significantly different from the other. So that might be a consequence of the natural phenomena that you are observing or recording, or it could be some anomaly that is caused by some malfunction at that particular sensor. So it could be a natural phenomena as well. So let's say at, in an industrial plant, so one sensor is measuring pressure at uh, measuring pressure within a steam boiler. Obviously within a steam boiler, pressures would be high. And there are other sensors at other places, those pressures would be low. So this would always be an outlier as compared to the rest. So in this case, we are completing, comparing the complete sequence with the other complete sequences. So shape outlier detection. So uh, in this case also, uh, 
you can use uh, the techniques that we have studied earlier because now if all the data are at the same length, then you can use the techniques that we studied earlier for outlet detection. So you can use, for example, LOF or you can use uh, the distance-based outlier and so on. So all of those can be used. You can even use the autoencoder uh, reconstruction-based technique, which would be quite effective in this case. So obviously now we are com comparing complete sequences. So let's say one sequence is recorded at location A. So now this one basically is a particular sequence. So this is for location A, you have another sequence for so location B and so on. You have many such sequences, let's say 100 sequences. And now after anomaly detection, you find that X55 is an anomaly, which means that the complete sequence X25. 55 is an anomaly. It's different from the rest of the sequences. Here also, of course, if you use a distance-based outlier or autoencoder or LOF that is unsupervised, but if you have labeled data, you can also apply a supervised technique, like supervised technique, which is essentially classification. So that is also fairly straightforward. Uh, and then, of course, there may be some more sophisticated techniques, but uh, uh, the differences are very minor. Those sophisticated techniques only kind of adapt to the specific application. So I think I mentioned this previously as well. Outlier detection is very application specific. So because we have to normal, we have to model normal behavior, uh, which is of course application dependent, and deviation from that normal behavior then basically signifies your outlier characteristic. So, so usually outlier detection algorithms may be tailored to the specific application. So applications in the financial sector, applications in the, let's say, industrial uh, domain, uh, applications in the medical sector, they may, might be tailored accordingly to those specific needs. So now let's move on to classification, which I think we have kind of covered as well already, but that's just for completeness. So here again, we have two, two options, point classification and shape classification. So point means that you want to classify any particular point and that classification would of course, depending on your application could be anything. For example, like previously we said it's anomaly or not an anomaly. So that's classification. You may have other classification options depending on the application, like uh, maybe in an industrial setting, you might want to identify grades of severity of a particular phenomena. For example, you can say low, medium, high. So there will be three classes and so on. So here, of course, you have classifying every point. So for this case, since this is time series data, you would typically be using supervised learning. By the way, classification is supervised learning and you would be typically be using uh, sequence classification approaches. So sequence classification. So you can use a Markov chain type of model like HMM or you can even use uh, the sequence uh, neural network models that we talked about briefly, like RNN and GRU and LSTM and transformers. And as I said, you can also use hidden marker models. So in this case, you are going to get a class label for each observation, for each point in the time series. Okay. So for this, as I said, you do need a sequence modeling approach. So what about shape classification? So shape classification is more closer to the traditional classification. So especially if the whole shape, if the whole sequence is of fixed length, then you can consider that to be your input vector. And then you want to 
provide a label for the entire shape, whether this is, uh, let's say, anomalous or not anomalous. So, and of course, here you can use any classification technique, like uh, decision trees can also be used, although they are less common for continuous values, less popular for continuous values. For continuous values, we will typically be using uh, things like support vector machine or neural networks and so on. All right. So uh, I think that is pretty much it. Um, you can also, by the way, use the K nearest neighbor classifier. Uh, of course, to use the K nearest neighbor classifier, you need to have a way of quantifying the similarity between two time series. And we had already talked about them. If the two time series are of the same length, then of course you can use occlusion distance. If they are of different lengths, you can use D uh, dynamic time warping. Okay, so dynamic type warping can be used to compute the similarity. And then of course you can find the nearest neighbors and from those nearest neighbors and the labels, you can make a classification. Okay, so I think that is essentially um, all that we had to cover uh, in this uh, lecture as well as in this course. So time series analysis is being discussed from chapter 14, 14 of Ag Agarwal's book, Agarwal book on data mining, the textbook. So the book is data mining, the textbook by uh, Charu Agarwal, A G. So, so chapter fourteen is on time series. I've uploaded this chapter on LMS, and I think the book can also be found online. Uh, so, this is actually a good book, a more comprehensive book. It con contains many more topics than the two books that we had. Uh, focused on in this course, the introduction to data mining and the data mining concepts and techniques. So this has more advanced topics and it's a good book to have uh, for all data miners who want to go deeper into data mining. So it covers more advanced topics like spatial temporal mining as well. It covers topics in uh, GIS mining, topics in stream mining, graph mining, and so on. So, okay, so any questions? So I think that brings us to the conclusion of this semester on data mining. Uh, we do have a couple of lectures scheduled next week, but those are uh, for extra time. Uh, I think I will conclude my new content today. I would not add or start any new content. Uh, but if you guys want to have a review session, please let me know. Uh, we can schedule that on Tuesday. and. Uh, the exam for the course, of course, is uh, a bit far away. You have a eat break. So you have at least a couple of weeks. I don't exactly know the time and date, uh, but you do have the schedule with you. So the exam would be held on that scheduled date and time. And the exam would contain uh, material primarily post-mid, primarily post-mid. So maybe a few concepts like the pre-processing concepts may continue after mid. Uh, but the main topics that we considered before mid, like association mining, they will not be tested in this final exam. 
So I will uh, send out a, a more detailed syllabus for the exam later on. So, uh, but primarily, as I said, you should focus on the content that we covered after the mid. All right, so I think uh, uh, that's all from my side. So thank you for taking part in this course. And I hope you learned uh, something from this course. Data mining uh, is a popular area. Uh, it's also an evolving area. So if you are interested in this area, you will be continuously learning over the, over the years in the future as well. So things change over time. So I've been teaching this course for uh, on and off for the past, let's say 15 to 20 years. So the content has evolved significantly since then. So things like autoencoder and neural networks uh, were not discussed like even five years back. And uh, there are now techniques uh, in classification and clustering that were dis not discussed uh, in the older days and in the previous times. The so things change. And the chain, of course, is more common in the more advanced topics, which was not the focus of this course, but there are more significant changes in those advanced topics, for example, graph mining and, uh, for example, time series analysis and so on. So there are more changes in those topics than in the basic topics that we covered in this course. So, okay, so that's all from my side. So. Uh, so we'll see you next time and especially see you during the exam. So if you have any questions, uh, you can always email me and I can schedule a meeting with you. And we also have the regular office hours uh, on Monday and Friday between 2.30 and 3.30. All right.